And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Here, on the puff of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. If needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. Good morning again, everyone. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online right now. If you're out in the atrium, how's it going out there? Maybe you're over in the CLC, and we're glad you're with us, too. Uh, it is MEA weekend. You know that, and everyone else is out having fun. No, we're having fun. We're here at church, and uh, it doesn't slow down around here at Hosanna and MEA weekend. We had a couple of weddings. In fact, I did one yesterday. Luke and Jenny, sweet couple. And uh, also today, we have our annual meeting after this service, about 15 minutes after this service ends. Our annual meeting is for ministry partners or members Voting members, Pastor Bill will be giving us some highlights from the previous year and a preview of the upcoming year, and we'll be electing our new vision board members. So uh, check that out after the service. I am wearing a suit. Did you notice? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Some of you are like, finally, it's not a mirage, okay? Pastor Bill started this a couple weeks ago, and then Shay kept it going. Although, did you hear that Bill had to help Shay tie his tie? Did you hear that? Try to get that visual, you know, like, how did that work? Anyway, uh, I'm just thankful for clip-on ties, you know what I'm saying? Uh, actually, this is a double Windsor right here, okay? I did this. Uh, some of you showed up, you're thinking, man, I thought this was kind of an informal church, and you showed up in your shorts and your flip-flops, and if that's you, it, uh, it's uh, winter now or fall, so you should let go of summer. But, but if you're worried about having to dress like this all the time, don't worry, because we don't dress like this all the time. We're stepping it up a notch for this series that we're in right now, The King's Speech, Sermon on the Mount, the greatest speech ever given. And so we are just stepping it up for a few weeks in respect and reverence. Now, every week of this series, we've been reading a theme passage from the Sermon on the Mount. At the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7 Jesus, in this passage, is kind of wrapping up the speech, and he's teaching the people then and the people now, us, how to respond to the Sermon on the Mount. And he describes what happens if you respond well and what happens if you don't respond well in this passage. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for teaching us then and now. Your words speak truth. So help us to hear, but not just hear. Help us to follow so that when the wind comes and the rain falls, our houses, our lives will stand. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Now, Jesus covers a lot of ground in the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of ground. We just can't cover all of it in four weeks. Uh, Pastor Bill gave a great overview the first week of the series. You should check that out online. Uh, and we want you to read the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Read it multiple times. You cannot read the Sermon on the Mount too much in your life, and certainly not in this series. This teaching of Jesus, the greatest speech ever given. So we can't cover all the ground, but we've covered some important ground. Starting with week one, uh, Pastor Bill talked about the Beatitudes and real happiness and what that looks like. And then last week, Pastor Shea gave this great message on loving your enemies. The idea that, that, that loving our enemies is central to being a follower of, of Jesus. Good message, and you should check that out too if you haven't heard it already. 
today we are going to talk about worry and anxiety. Worry and anxiety. Interesting week to be talking about worry and anxiety, don't you think? With everything going on in Washington and the political front, uh, do people struggle with worries in, in our world today? Absolutely. We threw this question out on Facebook, what do you worry about? And I think we set an all-time record for responses to that question. People worry about lots of different things. What about anxiety? I think people struggle with anxiety. Is anxiety a big issue in our society today? Absolutely. It is huge. It's a huge issue in our society. It's a huge issue in this room. If I were to have people raise their hands, if, if they struggle with anxiety in, in a significant way, statistics tell us that one out of five people would raise their hands in this room. One out of five. And that's just people who are aware and acknowledge that struggle. One resource I read said that, that anxiety is the number one mental health issue for women. And it's the number two mental health issue for, for men, right after substance abuse for men. Which in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, men are self-medicating what? Their anxiety it's a huge issue, and for many, it is distracting. For some, it is debilitating. And wouldn't you know, Jesus has something to say about worry and anxiety in the greatest speech ever given in the Sermon on the Mount. So let's look at this passage. This passage is Jesus' core teaching on worry and anxiety. It's in Matthew 6, starting at verse 25. And if you want to follow along in one of those red Bibles that you can grab on the way in, it's on page 581. Starting at verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? It's a great question, isn't it? I mean, Jesus, he asked great questions. I mean, isn't your life more than food? Isn't your life more than clothing? Another way to say that is, is, it, is your life, does your life equal clothing? Does your life equal food? Does your life equal your bank account? Does your life equal, you know, your job? Of course, the answer is a rhetorical question. The answer is no. <laughs> Jesus wants to get us thinking about that. But he says, do not worry. Uh, the word, the Greek word translated worry there can also be translated anxious. Do not be anxious. In fact, other, in other places in the New Testament, that same Greek word is translated anxiety or anxious. So worry and anxiety. Now, for the sake of this message today, we need to differentiate between two types of anxiety, okay? And if you're taking notes, this is where you might want to start jotting some things down. There are two types of anxiety, general, broad general categories here. The two types are worry anxiety and biochemical anxiety. Worry anxiety and biochemical anxiety. Now, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is primarily addressing worry anxiety. And I'll explain why a little bit later. Uh, but, and what is worry anxiety? Worry anxiety is when, you know, your thoughts and how you think and how that leads to worry. But I just want to spend a moment talking about biochemical anxiety because it is a huge issue, as I said earlier, in our society today. What does it mean, biochemical? Bio, biology. Chemical, chem chemistry, your brain chemistry. So biochemical anxiety is related to how our body and our brain function. There are lots of forms of biochemical anxiety. There's generalized anxiety, for instance. Uh, there is panic anxiety, separation anxiety, social anxiety. Uh, OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, is an anxiety-related uh, disorder. There are lots of different forms of anxiety. What are some of the symptoms that you might have if you are suffering from this type of anxiety? Uh, an increased heart rate. Uh, for an extended period of, periods of time, uh, difficulty breathing, sweats sometimes, chills, sometimes even with mild forms of anxiety. And we all get this from time to time. Your hands get cold. My hands always get a little bit cold before I preach, right? That's good to have a little bit of that in your stomach, but um, that's anxiety. So we're going to focus mostly on worry anxiety and the teaching points from the Sermon on the Mount. But if you think that you know, biochemical anxiety is something that is... Uh, hitting your life or someone you love, I want to recommend a resource to you. It's called The Anxiety Cure. This book 
uh, the, the title I don't love because it suggests that it's just that easy. You know, read this book and you'll cure your anxiety. It's not <laughs> quite that easy. I like the subtitle better, Dealing with Worry, Stress, and Panic in Life. And it's written by a guy named uh, Dr. Archibald Hart. He's a professor at Fuller Seminary, so he has a Christian kind of worldview. And he addresses anxiety from all angles, but he focus, focuses particularly on stress and how stress can lead to an overactive adrenal system, causes our adrenaline to just shoot through the roof. And when we have adrenaline shooting through the roof, it causes what? Anxiety. Anxiety. <laughs> Here's the thing about anxiety. We all have some anxiety. It's part of what it means to be human, right? And we all struggle with anxiety at some level from time to time. Not all anxiety is bad. In fact, performance psychologists uh, contend that, that some anxiety is, is necessary for optimal performance. And, and we were created, designed with this mechanism called fight or flight. It's, it's survival. It's what's, what helps us survive. So some anxiety helps us survive. So the problem isn't some anxiety, it's excessive anxiety. And Jesus has something to say about that too. Jump to verse 27. Another question. Jesus says, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Can all your worries or anxieties add a single moment moment to your life? Again, great question. And of course the answer is no. All of our worries and our anxieties, they don't add any time to our life. If anything, they what? Subtract, detract, take away from. Excessive anxiety shortens life. Shortens life. The, the, the health implications for stress and worry and anxiety are well documented. It can cause heart issues, strokes sometimes. Um, some medical professionals uh, suggest that, that over, over stress and worry and anxiety can actually make us predisposed to other diseases like cancer and so forth. So some of you, your stress level, your anxiety is so high, you're, you're literally putting your life at risk. You're shortening your life. It's that serious. It can be even more serious. Excessive anxiety can actually cause someone to prematurely end their life. Some of you know my story. I've, I've shared it before. It was a while ago. But in my teen years, my struggle with anxiety, what I now know to be anxiety, uh, came to a head in my late teens. And there were some trigger events, like moving away from home for the first time to go to college and breaking up with a girlfriend uh, after four years of dating. Um, but really at the core was this anxiety. And the anxiety led to depression. That often happens. There's often a causal relationship between anxiety and depression. They're close cousins. Basically, you just get tired. Your body just gets tired of all that anxiety, and you go into depression. And it was a dark time for me then. So dark that I even tried to take my own life. Unfortunately, I was unsuccessful, <laughs> and that was when God got a hold of me in a very significant way, and I'll talk about that later on. And I'm in a much different place than I was then, but, but it's always something I'm, I'm going to have to keep an eye on in my life, anxiety. I come by it honestly. A lot of times, anxiety issues are genetic, and, and both nature and nurture can play a role. For example, firstborns can be a little more predisposed to anxiety. I'm a firstborn. Why? Because parents are really anxious when they have a child for the first time, right? Like, I don't know how to change diapers, and we're checking our, on our kids every 15 minutes, and they're like, let me sleep, you know? And then your second child, you're like, okay, you know? And by the third child, you're like, whatever, you know? <laughs> our third child will probably be running through the street barefoot in the middle of winter drinking Mountain Dew at age two. I mean, probably, you know? It's like you just kind of let go, but those firstborns. So why am I sharing, why am I sharing all this with you? Um, in part to be transparent, to let you know we struggle with, with this stuff too. And also I want to I highlight this issue. It's a major issue in our society today. And if you think you are struggling with anxiety in the ways that I'm describing it, here's what I want to say to you. Get help. Get help. Get help from all angles. Spiritually, of course, start there, but in some cases, we got to go beyond that. Psychologically, physically, medically, 
There are two gutter balls when it comes to mental health in, in our world today. And one gutter ball is we can be too quick, and listen carefully, we can be too quick to turn to medication to solve our, our issues. You know, we're sad, we're struggling with life, and we're just quick to do that sometimes. Maybe too quick. Along those same lines, uh, we can think that medication will solve all of our problems, right? And, and it takes more than that. Spiritual healing and therapy and counseling. A lot of times medication, when it's needed, gets us to a point where we can actually deal with some of our issues, but it doesn't solve everything, right? It's one gutter ball, though. The other gutter ball, and this message comes from, unfortunately, from Christianity, bad Christianity, I think, which says that, oh, we should never take medication for mental health issues. That's a, that's a sign of weakness, or you're just not praying enough, or, you know, you should be ashamed of doing that. So hear me, there is no shame in, in dealing with from all fronts, spiritually, psychologically, and medically, physically. There's no shame in seeking help if you really have a brain-related, biochemical issue with anxiety. There's no shame in that. It is just like seeking medical help for a broken leg or for diabetes. The only shame would be, it would only be a shame if it continued to subtract from your life and maybe even more tragically, prematurely end your life. There's biochemical anxiety. Jesus, as I said, is addressing worry anxiety. How we think about our lives. In fact, biochemical anxiety probably wasn't an issue for people as much in Jesus' day, if at all. Many people believe, and I agree, that this biochemical anxiety is a product of our modern world where there's way too much stress and we're going way too fast but what Jesus is going to teach us from here is as true today as it was then, and, and it's helpful whether you're dealing with biochemical anxiety or worry anxiety or both, or if you just want to live a little bit more. So first, Jesus says, don't worry. That should be enough, right? Don't worry. Have you ever tried to tell someone who worries or if you worry a lot, then someone tells you, don't worry. It makes you worry more. There's this great uh, comedy bit online. You can find it online. Just Google Bob Newhart, who apparently is someone who used to be on TV. Bob Newhart. <laughs> stop it. Bob Newhart. Stop it. Okay? And uh, in this bit, he plays a psychologist, and he gives his client five clients five minutes Right? And he says, I'll give you a couple minutes to describe you know, what you're afraid of and what your phobias are, what your anxieties are, and then I'm going to respond to you. He says, here's my response. I do it with every client. You can write it down if you want to, but it's just two words. He says, here's what I want to say to you. Stop it. Stop it. And he says that to every client, and the client's like, oh, you know, that's not, stop it. You know, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's not funny if you struggle with worry and anxiety, right? Stop it, or just don't worry, actually usually has the opposite effect. And that's not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is not saying just stop it or don't worry. He's saying don't worry, but then he gives some practical pointers for how to deal with worry. Look at verse 26. He says, look at the birds. Underline that word look. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? We'll come back to that question. Another great question. But let's jump to verse 28 because we've already read verse 27. And why worry about your clothing? Look, again, underline look. Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. I had you underline this word twice. Look, Jesus' first pointer is pretty simple in dealing with worry. And it's stop to look. Stop to look. Let's emphasize stop first for a moment because this is really important we get that first because in order to look at birds, you actually have to stop. First, Jesus is saying, you know, stop, pull back, take a deep breath. You're going too fast. One of the things that, that the author of this book points out is that we were designed to go at camel speed, right? And, and we're going at Mach 7 speed. 
And a lot of the worry and anxiety that's, you know, physiological in, in, in nature, maybe it starts as a worry and turns into something more than that, it's just because we're going so fast. We're, we're, we're in constant, you know, adrenaline rush mode. Stop, slow down. You know that saying, stop to smell the roses, right? When's the last time you did that? Maybe not literally roses, but when's the last time you stopped and kind of take in your life? If you haven't done it recently, do it, and then ask yourself this question when you do it, when you do. Am I living like God depends on me, or am I living like I depend on God? See the difference there? Am I living like God depends on me, like the world depends on me, like it, the, you know, it'll stop spinning on its axis if I you know, don't do something? Or am I living like I depend on God? Stop. Then Jesus specifically says, stop to look at the flowers. Stop to look at the birds. Look at the birds. Now, if you're someone that struggles with worry and anxiety, how do you receive that? Look at the birds. You're probably thinking, look at the birds? I'm working 80 hours a week. I've got three kids. Two of them are puking at home. The grass is three feet long, and the Vikings can't find a quarterback. I don't have time to look at the birds. I don't even have time to, like, breathe or brush my teeth let alone look at the stinking birds here. And Jesus, Jesus will listen. Say, are you, are you finished? Okay. He'll say, look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They don't plant or harvest or store up in barns. Maybe in more modern terms, they don't have 401ks. They, they don't get college educations. They don't hold their kids' hands everywhere they go. They don't put a helmet on them the moment they roll out of bed. And right, you know what a bird's parenting strategy is, actually? You build a nest as high as you can, and then long before we would think they are ready, you push them out and say, good luck, right? How's that for a parenting strategy? Look at the birds. We can learn something from them. Not that you shouldn't have 401ks or that you shouldn't go to college or that you should push your kids off high ledges most of the time, right? But look at how they live. And they live with this carefree kind of, you know, I'm going to be provided for. It's just kind of going to happen. My creator provides carefree. And when you look at the birds, consider this. God cares for them. And how much more will he care for you and provide for you? Which brings us back to that question I told you we'd come back to. In verse 26, it says, And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Aren't you? Aren't you far more valuable than the birds? Now, I know there are some bird lovers out there, and this may offend you, okay? But, but what Jesus is saying here is humans are more valuable than birds. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are more valuable than birds? If so, repeat after me. I believe that God loves me more than the birds. Okay, that's a good start, all right? What Jesus is saying here is, and his second pointer for addressing worry is, consider your value. Consider your value. Now, how do we consider our value? How do we do that? I can tell you how we, we often do it, I think. Generally speaking, we, we assess our value or consider our value one of three ways. This is how I and you and I consider our value. What I do, number one. Number two, what I have. Number three, what others say about me. We often assess our value that way. What I do, what I have, what others say about me. In fact, you might even want to, it's not directly in your notes there, but just jot them down. Do have others say. And if you were to do an honest inventory of your life, you would find that you are oftentimes assessing your value based on one of those three things or all of the above. Here's the problem. None of them give you your true value. None of them give you your true value. In fact, if anything, they are major sources of worry and anxiety. What I do you know, what I have, what others say about me. 
worry. Not your true value. Your true value isn't based on what others say about you, it's based on what God says about you. Your true value isn't based on what you have, it's based on what God gives you. Your true value isn't based on what you do, it's based on what God has done for you. See the difference? So what has God done for you? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. What has he done for you? He has given his most precious thing. He has sacrificed his most precious thing. That's what he's done for you on the cross. He's he's done the most that he could possibly do. What has he given you? He's given you everything that comes with that sacrifice of his son. He gives you eternal life that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He gives you life to the full here and now. He gives you forgiveness and freedom and the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, peace. We've got a word this weekend that, that people here who will be coming to worship here just need to experience his peace. And we've been sensing that this whole weekend in worship and throughout peace. He's given you everything. What does he say about you? Because of what Jesus has done, he says, this is my son. This is my daughter with whom I am well pleased. This is my child. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of her. He says this about you, like he said over the first human beings after creating them, he says, they are very good. Not just what does he say about you, what does he say to you? And that deep, dark pit that I was in that I mentioned earlier, almost 20 years ago now, I heard God speak to me audibly for the first time and the only time in my life. But in the middle of the night, in the midst of that darkness, God woke me up very gently and whispered these words, I love you. I went back to sleep, filled with more peace than I'd ever experienced before. He did it again. I love you. I don't know how many times that night. Let's just say I woke up the next morning a different person, all right? And I think part of the reason, I know that's, that's why I'm a pastor, and I think it's part of the reason why I'm still here is to send that same message to you that God wants to say to you, I love you. And that your value is based on being the beloved of God, a beloved child of God. See, when you stop to consider your true value, it can stop worry in its tracks. Why? Because you realize that you have this infinite value to God and go, man, if I have that much value to God, he's going to take care of me. He's going to provide for me. The rest of verse 30. Another question. Jesus says, why do you have so little faith? Again, we got to work with the Greek here a little bit because that, that word that's translated faith can also be translated trust. So we could hear Jesus saying, why do you have so little trust? And we could hear Jesus berating us with this question. Why do you have so little trust? Or we can hear what I think Jesus is trying to communicate to us, and that is, I'm giving you the key to overcoming worry here. It's trust. Jesus' third and most important pointer is trust in God. So simple, isn't it? In God we trust. Every time we handle a a bill... In fact, I encourage you to do that this week. Is I know most of us don't carry cash anymore, but when you do, just look on the back. In God, we trust. But do we? How do we trust in God? Jesus, another part of the Gospels, he kind of tells us. Whoever wants to enter the kingdom of God and experience all that God has for you must become like a what? A child. A child must have faith like a child, trust like a child. After I heard God whisper those words to me, uh, for a couple years after that, I carried a picture of myself as a young child, just to remind me of that moment, but also to remind me that that's, 
the kind of faith I need to have, a childlike, trusting faith. See, kids, they don't, they don't get stressed out as much as we do, right? They, they don't respond to stressful situations the same way we do all the time. They kind of have this innate trusting, it's going to work out somehow. And we found a video that captures this perfectly. Watch. something about babies and diapers that makes everyone feel warm and fuzzy inside, right? <laughs> Although I'm having a different response because I'm going to be changing those bad boys in a couple months again, but, but there's something about that. And, and how do they respond to stressful situations in that video? Like, okay, I got fired. It's going to work out somehow. Dropped everything on the floor. Dropped my keys between... Now, that might be an exaggeration, but we're kind of getting a sense for it, right? This carefree, childlike trust. You know the song in the background? What song is that? We didn't hear the words. Don't worry, be happy, right? Don't worry, be happy. That's a good song, but, but I think it's a little misleading because it suggests that in order to overcome worry, we just need to be happy, you know? Just be happier and, and you'll worry less. It's a little misleading. I think a better title would be Don't Worry, Be Trusting. It's not as catchy. We'll have Chris write this song, though. <laughs> Don't worry, be trusting. Who do we trust? Jesus tells us here as we finish out this passage. So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Trust the Father. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And then this last verse, I like this one at the end. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. If you believe that, say amen. 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 So Jesus is saying, don't worry. But he's not just saying, don't worry, stop it. Stop being so anxious. He's saying, don't worry, stop to look. Consider your value. And trust in God. Because trust is the antidote to worry. Trust in God. It's the true cure to worry, trusting in God. Another part of the Bible, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. One of the songs that we sang earlier, Oceans, one of the lines to the song, give me trust without what? Borders. In a, in a moment, I'm going to pray for you about that, that God would give you that sense of ever-growing trust, trust without borders, more trust, less worry. And less worry, more life. But before I do that, something that we take very seriously when we craft messages is we think about this. How do we help them take their next best step? I mean, you've heard a message on worry and anxiety, and for some of you, okay, that's, that's enough and that's good, and some of you are like, I need to take a next step. And there are a number of potential next steps. They're in your sermon notes, number five there. One would be to just pray. You know, certainly pray on your own, pray with loved ones. But why not pray today with a prayer minister about this up front or in the prayer room? I know some of you are thinking, man, if I come forward, everyone's going to think that I struggle with anxiety. I just shared with over a 1,000 people that I have struggled with anxiety, all right? So don't, don't worry about that. It'd be much better that you receive prayer, that God would start to move in your life to help you overcome that worry. And people don't know what you're being prayed for anyway. Come forward for prayer. Read, read the, and study and memorize scripture. Having scripture in your memory, and right when you need it, can short circuit those worry cycles. Maybe you wanna pick up that book, The Anxiety Cure, it's in the bookstore. We have some great programs here, ministries, Life Hurts for Teens, Celebrate Recovery for Adults. 
and a group that really focuses on issues like this within Celebrate Recovery. In just over a week, we're having a mental health community forum here at Hosanna, trying to help community, then the faith community, kind of overcome the stigma of mental health and how we can help people in our community. You may want to check that out. Maybe professional care for you. We have some great resources available at the care booth. Maybe make a sozo appointment or inner healing prayer ministry. But all of us could afford to do number five under the discussion questions, if you look at your notes there. And that would be to carve out more time in your life, to slow down, go at camel speed for a while, stop to look, consider your value and trust in God more. We're going to take some time to do that right now. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we're so thankful that you gave this speech 2,000 years ago. And those words ring true today. Jesus, we, we all have bouts with worry and, and anxiety, some more than others, Lord. There are some in this room that are, are just sense it, that are trapped, feeling trapped, stuck in anxiety or worry. And Lord, we pray today that this would be a breakthrough moment for them. God, that your spirit would break through and lead them to that next step that they need to take. God, we also pray that you would help us to grow in trust, each and every one of us. I pray increased trust over this room, expanded trust, deeper trust, trust without borders, more trust, less worry, so that we, like children, can come before you knowing that we have infinite value in your eyes and that as you care for the birds and the lilies, how much more will you care for us? God, thank you for your peace and your presence. We feel it. And now lead us in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the blessing. God wants to bless you in a multitude of ways, but hear this ancient blessing from God's heart to yours. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look with favor upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great week.